Hello and welcome to this year's final episode of What's Next. I'm your host, Matt Brading, and this week we're doing a special week where we'll be taking a look back at film, music and games from the past year. Later on, I'll be talking to our guest, Tom Dibb, but before that, here's Rob and Bella with the reviews. The number one best film in the What's Next archive has got to be that of Django Unchained. The film is a lengthy and brutal homage to the spaghetti western set in pre-Civil War uh, in Mississippi. Although a top cast, the film fails to build a dramatic climax and ends like any other Tarantino film. Christoph Waltz and Jamie Foxx play Skultz and Django, a deadly pair of, on the quest to compete the bounties and reunite Django with his wife. The soundtrack is complete with traditional spaghetti western twangs to modern rap. The music is incredible and fits the scenes perfectly. Tarantino throws every idea that he has at the screen at expense of a dramatic thrust. There are flashbacks and dream sequences, montage and huge on-screen captions to tantalise the dramatic narrative. Generating menace and tension are the quite better scenes such as the dining table negotiation that allows the actors to give the script more polish than it deserves. If you're not afraid of seeing a little movie made blood, moments of sudden comic violence give away to the moments of pure blood drenched carnage. The film won two of its five BAFTA nominations, as well as two of five Oscars, including Best Supporting Actor and Best Original Screenplay. It's definitely one to watch. Coming up with a favorite song out of all the songs we have previewed on this show was a very hard task for us. Music is very personal, can have you screaming with outrage with any song that we choose. One song that was a big hit has got to be Taylor Swift's We Are Never Getting Back Together. Upon its release, the song reached the top position on iTunes, the singles chart, in 50 minutes, hence breaking the previous record held by Lady Gaga's song Born This Way with a record of an hour, making We Are Never Getting Back Together the fastest selling single in digital history. Taylor Swift is the first female to have two million selling album openings and holds the record for the highest number of album sales in a decade. So. Music takes aside, there is no denying the allure that Taylor Swift has created. Back in an October episode, we told you about the Walking Dead game. The game won the Story and Best Handheld Game category in the British Academy of Games Awards. The Walking Dead was awarded the Game of the Year, Best Adapted Video Game, and Best Downloadable Game at the 2012 Spike Video Game Awards. Melissa Hutchinson's role as Clementine was named as Best Performance by a Human Female while well, Dave Fenoy was nominated for Best Performance by a Human Male and Telltale Games awarded Studio of the Year. Telltale Games brought this game out in five episodes via digital download, although now you can buy a physical version of the game due to its popularity. Its genre is a point and button adventure game that is set in the world of The Walking Dead. However, the storyline is totally separate from the television show. It is really worth a play. Okay, so we are now going to the news section. Hello, guys. Hello. Hello. Uh, let's get started. Um, okay, so the first news story is probably the biggest bit of music news, um, I guess, uh, this year, which is uh, about Gangnam Style um, becoming the most viewed video on YouTube. Over a billion views. Yep. Um, so the song was released in July 2012, but didn't really hit the mainstream until about September. Um, what do you guys think about it? Well, uh, some people think that it's going to be a one-hit wonder. Yeah. And I guess that's my view because I have listened to some of his other songs and they're definitely not as popular. He's yeah. had quite a few songs out before Although this one. Speaking, speaking of his other songs, I mean, the, with all the views that uh, Gangnam Style's had, it's caused a lot of other people who viewed Gangnam Style to look at his other music videos on YouTube. And some yeah. of those, I mean, they've got more than at least 60, 60 million views. And so I could say, you could say it's definitely been good for those as well. Yeah. And because it's the most viewed uh, video on YouTube, does that mean it's the best song ever? No. <laughs> no, it's just the most entertaining I, in, to people. In, yeah. I guess. in my opinion, I mean, you could say the best song ever as well. Not everybody's heard the best song ever because it's probably one that's not even being heard by mm. everybody. It's quite, for all we know, it could have about ten views on YouTube, and it's not getting enough publicity. Very philosophical today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Um, and usually, I have to throw this, but I can literally just hand it to you. You have Thank to throw you. it to me later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Disney's buying Lucasfilm and the Star Wars franchise in October. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, again, the biggest bit of film news. Do you want me to take that back from you? Yeah. <laughs> um, Rob, 
Yeah. What do you yeah. think about this? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I don't think I don't. As far as I'm aware, I don't think there's any more uh, new news which has come out with, from Not that really. season. I see the uh, new show. Because the they're what? doing something to 79 episodes or yeah. something like yeah. that, and it's the next film should be coming out in 2015. Yeah, because they've something sort of, like that. they've announced some stuff about the film. Like we were talking last week about Carrie Fisher. Carrie Fisher, I don't know. <laughs> who played Leia, who at the time confirmed that she was coming back, but then since no, that has yeah. denied it. Yeah. yeah. So who knows what's happening with that. And then George, George Lucas said something about they've got the whole cast back, back. and yeah. it's all a bit strange. I mean, yeah. they've, they've bought it for $4 billion, which I think is actually pretty low, yeah. considering how popular Star Wars is. Mm. I mean, they could have just bought the Blu-ray box set and been happy about it, but they had to buy the whole damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> $4 billion, they've kind of seen in, enough, in my, in my opinion, but... Yeah. Um, I suppose I suppose people have their opinions anyway. So yeah. some people think that Disney's going to take it too far as well. Like yeah. they've already they've already brought our DD two on so on like one of their shows. Yeah, and everyone's thinking, oh, what are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> That's business. All right, let's keep going. Okay. Where did this from? Oh. Caught it oh, just about. <laughs> Okay, this is about uh, the next-gen consoles. So the Wii U, it came out in uh, November with uh, better graphics than, than, than current, current consoles have r right now. Uh, however, you know, Sony, they, they announced their, their, the PlayStation 4, I think yeah. it was a, a few weeks ago, and uh, we're still waiting for an announcement on the yeah. Xbox. Xbox. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, which one, which one is everyone going to buy? Uh, I'm more of an Xbox player, really, but obviously... It's kind of hard to know since they yeah, haven't well. said anything. There's rumours going around that it's going to be called the 720 because that's double 360. I don't and think stuff, it's going to be called the 720. <laughs> you mean, for about at least three years or so, people have been saying, oh, the Xbox 720, the Xbox yeah, yeah, 720. Yeah, exactly. Everybody knows that name, that, and that's the point that it's just going to be so unoriginal. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, like, if you've got people at this point saying, like, firmly, I'm going to get this one, then that's when you know you're in fanboys and territory because, mm. like, Xbox could release an absolute pile of rubbish. They probably won't. Yeah. They're probably yeah. recently <laughs> great, but they could release a pile of rubbish. Yeah. Um, like, I think we need to see a bit more because even PS4 that's been announced, like we haven't we, seen that yeah, much yeah. from there it. Is, we just heard a lot about it. Yeah. For the Xbox, though, there is rumoured to be an event happening at sort of towards the end of April, maybe around April 26th, yeah. which is sort of similar to like the PS4 announcement. Okay. And it's probably going to be streamed as well, so I'll be looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, from from at least by E3 this year, we should we should know. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that's all for the news this week. Uh, thanks for joining me. No uh, we are now going to do our tech review, uh, which will be with Rob about the 3D Doodler. It seems that every day, more and more possibilities and applications are being discovered for this re new revolutionary process. However, cost remains an obvious issue. With, in with individual partners being large, expensive, and trying to maintain, most people can't exactly afford to put one in their home and go, go to town with it. Today we're going to review the 3D Doodler, the world's first three-dimensional printing pen that allows you to draw in the air. Much like a standard 3D printer, it employs a heated ABS plastic, which then cools the moment it is ex excreted from the d devices, instantly cooling and taking shape. And much like a pen or pencil, it is compact, handheld, and allows people to literally draw designs into being. It also requires no software or computers, making it inexpensive and easy to use. The range of what one can create is pretty much limitless. Using stencils, one can create 3D models for architecture, design specs, and proposed prototypes. Or, if you should choose, just put, a, just put the pen into any service and begin composing shapes, designs, and words out of thin air. Art is also an obvious application, since it gives the user the ability to create endless array of abstract designs and real and realistic designs. And of course, modeling, as shown in the video, could become a very popular and com competitive outlet for its use. And another ultra modern twist, the designers of the, three, of the 3D Doodle are using their website to elicit funds to help the cra them crowdfund their idea to make it commercially viable. But there was no trouble there. Of the 30,000 needed the pro to get the prototype off the ground, they managed to elicit a total of more than $2 million as as of this article's publication. Guess people really do want things to get, to get these things to get on the shelf. Look for it at your local hardware or art supply store. Imagine the possibilities of this pen, film, music and games. Given time, the pen could be used to create animations for film, music, videos and imagine being able to play the next Call of Duty on your living room table. 
the possibilities are endless. Let's go back to Matt, who has an interview with Tom. Okay, so I'm now joined in the studio by Tom Dib. Hey, Tom, nice to meet you. Pleasure, man. Uh, you've been playing in Stafford today, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, I, I rocked up at uh, Cafe Nero earlier, okay. earlier on this afternoon and play a few, play a few songs for the people of Stafford. Yeah, it's cool. Did it go well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice show, man. It's a good vibe. It's yeah. a good vibe around here. Cool, great. Uh, and this is part of your, your Cafe Nero tour, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you want yeah. to tell us a little bit about the Cafe Nero tour? Okay, yeah, sure. I mean, I started doing them probably like a year and a half or so ago, and just to kind of doing a few in a day, like the uh, suburbs of London and um, surrounding kind of counties. And then I went on to do one, um, like it was a, my camper van tour, like yeah. Cafe Nero camper van tour. It went from um, Norwich down to Brighton, then all the way along the coast to Penzance, then uh, up to the north, northern coast and did all of North Devon, uh, finished in Bristol. And then say a month or so after that, uh, in Cafe Nero got in touch with me and invited me to go and uh, go and do one in Dubai. So oh. I literally just got back uh, by the end of February doing wow. a week stint in Dubai. <laughs> so yeah, that was awesome, man. That's amazing. That's crazy, yeah. yeah. How, did, how, did you find, how did you find Dubai, was it? Oh uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating place, man. It was, it was somewhere that I never really thought to go, yeah. never, somewhere that I never really you know, wanted to go. Yeah, sure. But then the opportunity came up. And I've got to say, man, when I got there, the, it's so impressive. Yeah. You just got all these like metropolises <laughs> popping up. Yeah, it's crazy. I say popping up, like reaching to the skies, and then it's all connected up with motorways. It's just fascinating, <laughs> incredible, incredible place. All right, that's cool. So that's that's your tour. Uh, you're also doing some festivals, aren't you? Do you want to tell us about? Yeah, that? yeah. Over the next uh, next six months, I'm effectively living out of my camper van. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got loads of VW festivals. Um, uh, VW White Noise in, in Norfolk, uh, Bug Jam, uh, among among others, and so I'm going, yeah, yeah, all over the all over the country doing them, um, just kind of getting the music out to, I suppose, like-minded people. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've got a van. They got a van. We love the kind of the yeah. lifestyle of it, and I hope they'd uh, dig the tunes. It's um, quite it's quite interesting because a lot of our guests have sort of moved on to trying to get things out over social media and that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's great to see you actually going out and hitting the road and going to people directly. You know? Yeah, so it's, it's, I, I, I do suck at the old, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the online thing. I, yeah. do, I do struggle with that. But yeah, taking it, uh, taking it to the streets, man, it's, um, I think it's a great way to do it. And that's, I'm, I'm literally funding the tour just through busking yeah. and, um, and selling CDs, uh, T-shirts and bits. Yeah. We're going to be uh, hitting some more uni, um, uni bars as well, more Cafe Nero's. Okay. And then we've got Beach Break, um, Beach Break Live Festival as well, which okay. will be sick. That's cool. Uh, and we're going to look at a music video uh, that was made for you in just, just a second. Yeah, Do you want yeah. to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it's, um, it's for a track called My Inspiration. Yeah. Um, the song's kind of about feeling kind of on the edge where you think you might be slipping into a, you know, a pretty dark place, yeah. you know, getting a bit of a Halloween head on. Um, and kind of calling out to yourself or, or, or it could be someone else for you know, inspiration to kind of claw, you, claw your way back up. Yeah, sure. um, and the, the actual concept of the video came from the uh, dude I was working with who was, ended up being a director for this yeah. one. Um, and he wanted to, he'd heard the song and he, he'd got this image stuck in his head about like a raging bull meets fight club kind yeah. of thing. Uh, so yeah, effectively warehouse, girls all around screaming for this fucking horrible sized dude <laughs> um, who yeah, beats crap out of me. And then my inspiration kind of comes through and yeah, I end up with yeah, a little bit of a comeback. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Well, it sounds interesting. Let's take a look at it. And after that, we'll have John and Paul here to do a tutorial about how to shoot documentaries. So build me up to show me up to see The brightness that's inside when I see your thoughts It enlightens me yeah, yeah. Won't you be my inspiration? Catch me when I'm dreaming
Hi, and welcome back. Uh, I'm joined with uh, Paul, a lecturer from Staffordshire University. We're going to go over some techniques of what you can do uh, with interviewing during a documentary. So do you want to start? Excellent, absolutely. Um, one of the most important things when you're doing any sort of setups, any sort of filming for, for documentaries, is, is the content is really key uh, in terms of how you shoot things and how you set things up. Uh, but there's always the real fundamental things that you've got to consider as well. Um, so I can talk very, very quickly about um, some of those. Yeah. One of the most important things, if you grab that little seat there, yep. conveniently cool. set up for us. <laughs> um, one of the most important things is that you've got a stable platform to actually shoot your footage from. Uh, so the formalized traditional way of doing an interview would be based on a tripod, a nice stable platform. You can still put a lot of movement into that with zooms, with uh, refocusing, with reframing. So it's still a lot you can do with that. Um, first thing we do is we make sure we've got a good, well-exposed image. Um, currently, we have a well-exposed image. Um, and the most important thing is make sure that we're focusing that image correctly. And there's a very, very simple process that we can use for that, which is zoom, focus, frame. Yeah. And a very simple way of setting that process up uh, is use your contributor's eyes to set up the actual focus. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for that little eye light highlight that I can see in the eyes. I zoom all the way in, as far as the camera can zoom in, yeah. snap the focus, and then I zoom the camera back out um, to somewhere close to what I actually want uh, as my framing for this particular interview. It's because it can be quite distracting, isn't it, when you have a soft focus during a whole interview? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's one of the things that people notice very, very quickly. Is as soon as that little highlight, highlight goes out of focus, um, you've kind of lost that quality in the image yeah. that you're really looking for. Uh, and interviews are all about connection with your subject, so it's really, really important that you don't lose that. Uh, once we've got that set up, when we're looking at the frame, there's a couple of really important things to look for. Again, it's all dictated by the content, but again, the fundamentals that are in there, you're looking for headroom and you're looking for talking room. Yeah. So essentially, if I was doing this as an interview setup, I'd actually have uh, a producer stood by the side of me here that would be conducting the interview. So normally in an interview setup, you'd actually be looking somewhere in the region of where my hand is yeah. um, up here. And what that gives us, um, especially in a wide frame, is it gives us a talking room on this side of the screen. And what that is, it's a comfortable viewing um, sort of image for, for the people who are watching at home. So essentially, you're talking into, into that space. If you're turned the other way, you'll be crowded right into the edge of the frame. It makes for a very awkward um, sort of framing in the shots. And then the very last one we're looking for there is headroom. And again, that can work in a variety of different ways. Generally for um, documentary interviews, we're looking at not cutting off the top of the head. We're looking for a little bit of space above there. And again, yeah. it just gives us that breathing room um, in the shots. Some interviews can take a very, very long time to actually conduct. So it just gives us a little bit of flexibility when we're setting the camera up and framing. Which is not ideal why you have the tripod. Do you find it's always better when you're doing documentaries to work uh, with two people, just so you've got you know, someone who can always concentrate on what the camera's doing and someone who's looking at... Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It, the important thing with, with documentaries, it, it, it's that process of as soon as you observe the event, you change things. So if I'm stood behind my camera and as a camera operator, I want to be concentrating on yeah. the framing, the technical quality of that image uh, and making sure that I'm recording sound properly and all those aspects. So if I'm doing all of that, my focus is not going to be on my subject. And that's really important that the subject feels comfortable just talking to somebody. So if you've got the time in an ideal world, you would normally spend a very, very long time with your subject before you ever sit down and interview them, whether that's talking to them on the phone, corresponding with them. So before you ever pull the camera out and start doing that, you've got a really good connection with them. Is that to help like, get better responses from them? Because they feel uh, more comfortable around you. So when you're asking them quite personal questions, they feel more... Uh, willing to tell you what you need for your documentary. Work. Absolutely, absolutely. That is fundamental. Is What you're trying to do is you're trying to get that connection to that person. You're trying to make them comfortable that they're talking about uh, sometimes very traumatic things um, in interviews or sometimes very complicated things. So they have to be very natural and very comfortable. And the camera can sometimes be a barrier to that. So if yeah. my eye is stuck in an eyepiece and I've got headphones on, immediately I've broken that connection between myself and the subject. Okay, well that's all we've got time for uh, today. Uh, we're now going to have uh, an outside uh, documentary uh, from uh, students around the university uh, saying about their charts, uh, and then after that we'll have a performance from Tom Dibbs. Okay, so we're here for Staff TV, filming an outside documentary at Staffordshire University. Uh, we're going to be asking people what their favourite games, music and films are at the moment. So let's go find out. My name's Tom Mellor and I am the Technical Skills Specialist for Film Technology. My name's Dale 
Collier Woods. I am a member of Staffs TV. Uh, my name's Amy Dixon, and I do film production technology. This is Matthew Sean Evans. I am a resource officer at Staffs Uni. My name is Jamie. I'm a film student here at Staffordshire University. What are your um, favourite films that have been out this year since September? I really like the Avengers. I really Beasts of the Southern Wild. Zero Dark Thirty. Django Unchained. Wreck It Ralph. Wreck It Ralph. The whole the whole video game genre is is something I'm not so much passionate about, but I really enjoy. So everything about it from top to tail. Um, my favourite game at the moment has to be Far Cry Three, just because it's so open world and you can practically do what you want, and it's sort of like different view with games, it's very much um, animalistic, you've got to survive, you've got to sort of scavenge for stuff, and I just like the bow and arrow feature that you've got in the games, so yeah, it's pretty fun. Definitely looking forward to Man of Steel. Not a great fan of the previous Superman films, but I think this one will really kind of make it a whole new kind of film franchise. Um, written by Christopher Nolan and produced by as well, so that's something to really look forward to. With my music taste, it's sort of such across the board, like I love my dubstep, I love my party, I love my house music, but then I've also jumped back. So I love my Ben Howard at the moment, I'm really into his new, uh, his album, Every Kingdom, absolutely adore that. But then, then again, I'm into like Knife, Pow uh, Knife Party's new sort of EP that's just come out, and. But yeah, it's got to be Ben Howard across the board, yeah. So we've just finished a report here now at uh, Staffs Uni. We've got some really good stuff from uh, the students, uh, what their favourite charts were, uh, films, music and games, uh, what they liked about and what they didn't. Uh, so yeah, I've been John Gale, this has been for Staffs TV. Thank you and goodbye. What are you doing? Old man. Standing at the railings with your chin on your knees Wallowing in self-pity Don't you want to show us what you can do? Bust a little groove like you used to on the OQE2 Used to be a superstar, I heard you go oh, so far All of these things have to come to an end But don't fret, oh man, nothing stays the same we all have to change in order to educate one another so roll in your neck and put your balls on the line stop wasting what you value your time and start thinking what skills you can use rock up to the door comb your hair and stretch a smile I know it's been forever and a while But I'm sure that they say With absence just makes a heart keener So don't fret, oh man Nothing stays the same We all have to change In order to educate And don't fret, oh man Nothing stays the same Relationships have to change In order to educate one another And from a younger point of view I feel as you do And I know that it's hard to evolve I'm not saying change your soul Your beliefs or how you roll But a touch of compassion won't pain It's a selfish act from your past To source your love not to last an ounce of compromise is a great place to start So pick up off the floor and let's head out once more To a life that is too worth the living and Don't fret, old boy, we don't have to stay Wallowing on this way Subtly rotting away In order to educate one another, oh man. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh.
for doing that and unfortunately that is the end of what's next and this is the last episode for this year which also means that this is the last episode for me as your host and the last episode for a lot of the crew who are third years before we go i'd like to say a special thank you to our crew who have been amazing and without them this incredibly ambitious project wouldn't have happened i'd like to give an even more special thanks to our series producer and regular director sophie p lou without whom none of this would have ever started in the first place so thank you very much. Uh, I've been Matt Brading, and this has been What's Next for this year. Thanks for watching. <laughs>